Good morning and welcome to Health Matters with Medicine Center Pharmacy. I'm your pharmacist, Paul White. We're very glad you joined us. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Studio Arts and Glass, January Appraisals and Liquidations. Today, Brad and I are broadcasting from our administrative offices, and our very special guest is Michelle Metzger, RN, diabetes educator with Altman Hospital. Good morning, Michelle, and welcome back to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. All right, it's so nice to be on here with you. Um, Michelle has been a great partner with our patients for diabetes, and we're so pleased that she could join us this morning. If you're more than one of the 29 million Americans with diabetes, then you probably know this chronic condition can increase your risk for developing serious complications, including heart disease and stroke, high blood pressure, blindness, kidney and nervous system diseases. However, proper diabetes management can delay or even prevent the onset of these complications, allowing you to live a healthy, productive life. If you or a loved one have insulin-dependent type 1 diabetes, the more common type 2 or pregnancy-induced gestational diabetes, today's show will discuss positive lifestyle changes that will benefit your health now and in the future. We'd like to remind our listeners today, our program is also available on our podcast. You can download it using your favorite podcast app, just look for Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy and please subscribe. So Michelle, welcome back to the show again, as we said, uh, introduce yourself please and tell us what you do at Altman Hospital. Yes, thanks. Um, I appreciate you having me on. So I'm Michelle Metzgar and I am the diabetic educator here at Altman Hospital. I work with the patients that uh, the providers uh, send a referral, and they come to see us here as outpatients. We do virtual visits via like a telehealth, like we're doing right now, um, or Zoom. We actually see the patients uh, in the office as well, whatever they're comfortable with. And I also uh, provide education with uh, patients that come into the hospital that are newly diagnosed or that have complications with diabetes. I also help out the heart and work with uh, the heart and stroke programs here at the hospital. Um, but our, my main focus is, of course, all diabetes and helping our community um, live a healthier and stronger life. So... What about those people that are unfamiliar with the disease? What exactly is diabetes? Um, well, diabetes is the most common disease worldwide. And uh, we have worldwide about 420 million that have it. So mainly my job is to help here around our community to help them help with any complications and help it in control. So there's no more risk factors moving forward with their disease. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, I was muting the ambulance that was going by. What is the difference? <laughs> tell us, um, tell us, let's look at some numbers. How prevalent is the diabetes, is diabetes in the United States? Yeah, so you mentioned in the first part of your introduction about the 29 uh, million diabetic uh, diagnosed um, people. So we actually have in statistics 37 million in a, the United States. So that puts us around that 28, 29 that are diagnosed and about eight to eight and a half uh, that are walking around that do not know yet that they have uh, diabetes. So let's talk about some differences between type one and type two diabetes. Sure. So type one, um, back years ago, used to be called juvenile diabetes. You'll still hear it called juvenile diabetes due to the frequency of it um, 
being more diagnosed as a, as a childhood disease. Um, this type prevents the body from producing or eventually um, killing off the uh, beta cells that produce the insulin in the pancreas. So children to young adults have to take insulin to survive. Type two is a little different. Um, it also was known as um, onset adult diabetes, but now we're seeing more children with uh, type two diabetes just because of our lifestyle changes, the way we eat, um, our inactivity. There's a lot of things that can lead up to why our children have, we're seeing more of that as well. And then our type two, um, as you know, as a pharmacist, you see that all type two can be um, taken care of in many ways. Some just diet and exercise, some can be by a pill or many pills, and some can be pills and insulin. So it definitely is a choice in how they can take care of themselves. Can you touch on some of the signs and symptoms of diabetes as adults and maybe how they might differ with a child? So they're very similar. Um, you're gonna see a lot of similarities when they are diagnosed. They're gonna have uh, an increase in urination, a uh, increase in thirst, weight loss. Some get impaired vision or blurred vision. Um, some get mood swings. Children, you will see a lot that will have maybe night tears, uh, maybe wetting of the bed. Um, there's fatigue and increased hunger. So some get darkening of the skin. Sometimes uh, you will see, especially in adults, you'll see some around the neck base. Uh, but those, there's only a couple things that may vary, but a lot of it is similar uh, in the diagnosis. So... What is gestational diabetes? How does it differ from type one and type two diabetes? And, and why do certain individuals get it? So gestational diabetes, to be honest, we see a lot of gestational diabetes here uh, in the office and virtually. Gestational diabetes is diagnosed by what they call glucose tolerance test. They do up to three tests, uh, and this is through their doctor. Um, most women, uh, all of them should be tested at their physician's or their provider's office. Um, it is a form of blood sugar that affects them um, that their hormones, when they are changing, it is spiking their blood sugar. Some women get increased blood sugars and some women do not. And it is very dangerous to carry high sugars throughout a pregnancy. So it's very important to have the education, to learn how to eat correctly, to control, to control those blood sugars so it's safe for mom and baby. How do we... Okay, so let's, let's say... Uh, a lady gets gestational diabetes. Mm -hmm. Do we immediately take that individual to insulin or can we use oral products on them? Yeah, so if they're diagnosed with gestational, the first line of defense is diet and uh, proper exercise. So, and this works, we work, uh, we correlate together with the provider and they have blood sugar uh, glucose monitors that they are testing their sugars. The ladies have a little tighter range and they are testing up to five times a day. So they're testing a lot more than a regular diabetic. So their numbers are different. So they have to keep a closer range. So their first line of defense is not medication. It can lead to that. 
but it usually is insulin. If it goes too high, that is usually the safest route that they give. Um, and I don't see a lot of insulin, but I have done a lot of education with it. Okay, so now they're talking a lot about prediabetes. Um, how do we determine that? Um, so prediabetes is, of course, that precursor for diabetes. And um, it is something that we, we will see a lot of patients here that if they come in for any other kind of procedure, it might be shown on their labs that their numbers are slightly elevated to a pre-diabetic level. There are um, certain labs that can be drawn that will tell us what our blood sugars are doing. So an A1C, or they, you might hear it call it an HbA1C, that will determine what range our blood sugars are. A pre-diabetic can be headed into that world of type two diabetes, but it can be prevented with the correct diet and exercise. I missed a question. I missed a question on uh, gestational diabetes. What about later in life? That's okay. So yes, uh, gestational diabetes can lead to type two diabetes. Um, and the um, most women after their pregnancy post-op, when their baby uh, comes, they will have a six week checkup and they will have a blood draw to determine where their blood sugars are. Most women, they, their hormones will come back to normal uh, limits at their target range. And if some women have uh, a higher risk of that insulin resistance, and that's really what kind of is starting it to increase, some might have diabetes that will last right after. I've only seen a few, and some I've seen 20 years later that come back and say, I had gestational diabetes when I had my children. So it could creep up 10 or 20 years later. Okay, we got to take a break here. You're listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Flu vaccine along with Moderna and Janssen COVID vaccine are available at our stores. Stop by any one of our Medicine Center pharmacies to get vaccinated. No appointment is necessary. Michelle, before the break, we brought up prediabetes, and um, I kind of think of prediabetes as a warning klaxon that needs to be taken very seriously. I also kind of feel like it's one of those things like elevated blood pressure where you may not feel it or it may not affect your daily life, but it's that silent thing in the background that needs to be addressed. So can you talk about prediabetes and what we can do to prevent it from progressing to full-blown diabetes. Yeah, it definitely. It certainly is. It's something that's just kind of knocking at the door and it's there and it wants to come in. So eating healthy, exercising, um, they say at least 30 minutes most days. And I want to kind of eliminate that most. Do it every day if you can. Um, decrease your weight. That will really help with that insulin resistance um, and control your blood pressure. So less salt in your diet with that healthy eating. Um, and that's going to help definitely if you're eating better, you're decreasing your cholesterol. And if you smoke, try to um, not and try to make those changes because that also it all has to do with what's going on in your vessels inside and it really makes a difference M michelle i had a, an individual tell me um 
this person does not have diagnosed di diabetes, okay. I had this individual tell me that, it, that she um, consumed or ate anything like a, uh, like a cookie or something sugary, you know, um, that when she went to bed, when she went, tried to get to sleep, later on in the, in the night, she started shaking. Well, what is the, and, and apparently this does not happen when she doesn't consume any sugary product. What are we thinking here? I mean, I realize you can't diagnose this person, but, but is that a potential pre-diabetes person? Well, sometimes definitely foods. Um, if you are, a lot of people have very sensitive um, feelings when it comes to consuming carbohydrates or sugars. And uh, this is something food-wise we're going to discuss that can affect you. And high sugars in your diet definitely if, can affect how you feel. And your body has a hard time breaking those sugars down. And definitely eating it right before you go to bed, you're not doing anything to burn it off. Yeah, it's not, I mean, not, a, good, not was, a good idea. Yeah, so <laughs> if you're so, going to enjoy a cookie, at least uh, try to do it in, in some kind of manner that you're going to be able to do something to run, so, a, run a little marathon around the corner. So, so where I was going here, is this, is this a pre-diabetes possibility or, or not? I don't know. You know, that's something that I, I, I don't, I can't really, I don't have a crystal ball for anybody like sure. that, but definitely if they have any concerns, they can always talk to their uh, primary care and say, you know, I am concerned that I'm not feeling well. There is tests that they can do to draw to see how their blood sugars are doing. There's an HbA1c that we had mentioned earlier sure. that can be drawn. It does a three month look back on what their blood sugars have been doing. There's also a fasting glucose that can be done to see if their blood sugars are at a normal rate and a target rate. So that's something that she could have done just to put her mind at ease. Yeah, I just thought it was a curious situation. Uh, I've been known to eat a cookie before I go to bed. Okay, <laughs> but I've never. A lot of people. To, but a lot I've of never, people do for their snack. <laughs> but I've never had the shaking. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, okay. Uh, How yeah. often um, should someone get a hemoglobin A1C? So if they're diagnosed with diabetes, so are you asking for undiagnosed or diagnosed? I guess I'm asking for, you know, if someone is interested, how about for both, frankly, because okay. I think, you know, we've had patients that come in the pharmacy that are not diagnosed, but they might have a family member who is, and they're concerned about what their status is. So, you know, how would, what yeah. kind of tests should either patient get before we, you know, we got about two minutes here before the news. So if you could expound on that, it might help people get some clarity. Okay. So they are changing some guidelines with, um, the diabetes age and ranges, that's coming soon. Um, but for your provider, I would definitely work with them on it. But for undiagnosed, if you are at a normal level, they can take you out as much as uh, two to three years, if depending on your age and if you have no other risk factors. So it just depends. If you have um, if you are diabetic, depending on what your A1C is, they will test you every three months to six to see how you're doing to keep you in control and to make sure you're staying in control. So it definitely depends on where you're at and what's going on. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. It is about the air time for the news. Thanks for joining us this morning on Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Hi, Paul White here. As was said by JD, we are listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. We're talking with Michelle Metzger, RN and diabetes educator with Altman Hospital. We have a lot more to cover this morning, so let's get back to the show. All right, let's talk about genetics. So we all have a certain, uh, you know, hand we're dealt 
Um, how, what kind of role does genetics play in our risk of obtaining diabetes? So it plays a big role. Uh, that's actually one of the questions that we ask when patients come in, uh, whether they are any type of diabetic, even gestational. If you have grandparents, parents, or siblings that are diabetic, that is kind of the circle that we look at that can be connected. Um, but it definitely plays a big role on how you live your lifestyle as well, um, except for when we're looking at like type one diabetics. But as a type two, that healthy lifestyle can really help to not add that extra bucket when you already have the genetics that you've been given. Okay. I guess, I think it probably goes without saying that if um, there's certainly things that you can do to see if you have a higher risk by looking at your family history, like you just mentioned, but it makes it even more important to realize that if you have family members, especially immediate ones that have diabetes, you really need to be proactive rather than reactive in your lifestyle choices. So, but that's just something that's, you know, to keep it top of mind. Right. You know, I was just thinking our listeners may not really understand what your role is as a diabetes educator uh, and how you can really be an asset to the patient. Can you touch on um, what you do to help a patient that's been diagnosed recently or who is one that's been diagnosed with prediabetes and how you can help guide them through what really could be a terrifying diagnosis. Yes, most definitely. So uh, I, we, um, I work here at Altman and uh, I also work with a dietitian. So uh, Sue also does many other educations as well. But myself, I talk with the newly diagnosed or pre-diabetes and even existing diabetes that have had it for 20 years. So it's, it's never too late. Um, but we discuss the process of the disease and how to learn how to deal with the food choices, carb counting, all of that. And I'm here every step of the way to help them. If they are chosen to start to test their uh, blood sugars, then I teach them how to do that. I talk to them about the medications, all the risk factors. Some patients aren't aware that when they're diagnosed that they can actually come see a diabetic educator. There are so many insurances that cover diabetic education. So don't be afraid to ask your doctor for a referral to come uh, see me here over at Altman um, and or if you have questions, because we're here to help. You know, in the past, I, I know that you had uh, um, maybe evening meetings or, or group get togethers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would suspect that this uh, virus environment has kind of shut all that down. Um, so I guess what you're saying is you're meeting with people one on one. Yes, we make it very individualized and we make it very convenient on how they feel comfortable with doing the uh, meeting, whether it be a virtual meeting on the computer, on uh, through their phone uh, virtually or one on one in my office. And they were every patient is screened when they come in and uh, everything is cleaned. It's all very safe. What, what would you suggest that a, that a session with you, how much time um, would you allow? Um, oh, I, I, we normally block out an hour, but I had a new diabetic the other day that uh, him and his wife had come and it ended up, it was two hours. So it just really depends on the situation. If there's extra insulin teaching new to it, a whole new diabetic, and then the questions that they might have to ask. So depends on really it's individualized. Do you find much resistance in people poking their finger to, to check their blood? I mean, I just, I, <laughs> I tested one person the other day and I just, <laughs> I, just, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he looked yeah. the other way, you know, and just 
didn't want to look at the needle poke and da da da. I mean, I, I, I find it quite elementary, you know, in testing. Uh, but so many people, it's such a huge thing. It really is. You can see, you can have some of the strongest men walk in your door or some, some people that are um, very comfortable with whether it be tattoos or piercings, which is, which is definitely a needle-based thing, but it's different when you're having to stick your finger or know that you have to have an insulin shot. There is a comfort level in knowing that we can work with them to make them feel comfortable. We have, um, I feel, a good relationship with our patients to try to uh, work through it. Um, I don't know, many of you know, I have a type one diabetic son. So I have, um, I've dealt with trying to, you know, deal with from an eight year old perspective in poking and stabbing with things all the way up. So you, you get very comfortable in different stages and ages and all types of people. I love what I do. So I am very comfortable in trying to help them feel comfortable in, in having to deal with it also. I think a couple of the things that have really made this somewhat elementary are the very, very fine gauge lancets, and, you know, as well as the, the glucose monitors, which years ago required, required a drop of blood about the size of a teacup, you know, and, and now it's just so, so very, very tiny, the, the sample needed, uh, that the needle poke with a lancet is almost negligible, you know. Well, they need to know also that they need to change their Lancet. That Lancet is very important. They are a dime a dozen, yeah. if that. And the needle has to be sharp. It actually hurts less mm -hmm. if you use a new Lancet and if you are trying to cut a steak with a dull knife. Exactly. Yeah. So using a fresh Lancet, it's going to hurt less. And... So. Do, do people come to you and they, they do reuse them? I, I would never, oh. re, I would oh. never reuse a list. Never. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, yeah. They, they, uh, they think for one that it might not hurt as much. And then for two, they just, it's just a matter of changing it out. So that's a, an uh, important education piece. See, I don't even use the Lancet device. It's just, to me, it's like, this is scary. I'm waiting for the needle. I'm waiting for the needle to penetrate my it finger. It hurts less <laughs> when you have that trigger. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I don't know where we're at. I got lost here. <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> I think uh, we're, um, we're we're at what, what is a normal fasting blood sugar? Yeah. So the normal sugars. This kind of goes back when we were discussing about our prediabetes too. So. Anybody that gets uh, the blood drawn, when you take it back to the girl when we were discussing the cookie, uh, a normal blood draw, if uh, they were just to do a blood sugar, normal is 99 or lower for a blood sugar. Anywhere in a pre-diabetic window, it would be 100 to 125. And then anything over 126, they can indicate that that is diagnosed diabetes. But they also will maybe confirm it with an A1C, look at a back window. Um, it just depends on the uh, physician. And, but at 126 or over, especially if it's a lot higher, they can kind of tell. You know, it almost seems like uh, um, I do have type two diabetes, and it almost seems like there's about nothing you can eat <laughs> that, 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 that you know that, that functions with raising your blood glucose. You know, right? Um, so you know, fruit, even some fruits, and and really blow it up. You know, I love peaches and I love pears and I, you know that kind of stuff. And so, what would you say most foods are that that uh, influence blood glucose? 
So carbohydrates um, definitely are, they contain those factors of sugar and other things like fiber and our starch. They can increase our blood sugars depending on how much is, you know, carbohydrate, is it a donut or a carbohydrate? Uh, are we talking veggies? So um, sugars, definitely, if you're eating a candy bar, that's going to raise your blood sugar and spike it. Um, sugary drinks. I see more people walk in my office that are drinking nothing but sugary drinks and actually not eating all day. Yeah. So that's a huge component. If we took all the sugary drinks away from this world, we might see a better outcome. Huh. Um, so that's, that's a big difference. If everybody would turn their label and look at it. If you look at how much sugar is within a product, that makes a big difference. You like to look at things that maybe are six below, keep it low, It's not going to dump your sugar as much. Um, but you're right. But in moderation, there are things that you can enjoy, but it's just that overkill that we, we do. Well, I, I'm told that, that in some canned beverages, like 12 ounces or 16 ounces contains about 14 teaspoons of sugar, which is overwhelming when you, when you think about that, mm -hmm. it's like eating a sugar bowl. Um, yeah. Know. So, you know, you should, the whole bunch of them should be thrown out, I guess, even milk has sugar in it, you know, milk does. And that's one of the products that can be used. If you have a low blood sugar, it has some slight protein, but you can use that for a spike to bring back up your blood sugar, just like glucose tablets or orange juice. Milk is also a product that they use to spike it back up. Yeah. Um, we have so many products now that are almond milk that don't have all the sweetener in it. Yeah. So they're all, there are a lot of alternatives that don't add those extra carbs. If you want to enjoy a bowl of Cheerios, you can use silk milk. And some people that haven't tried it, you should try it just to see if you like it. You can't tell the difference really, um, but it's all in the preference. If not, you have to add those carbs up uh, to your daily or uh, meal allowance. Interesting. Okay, our final break here. You're listening to Health Matters at the Medicine Center Pharmacy. <laughs> 